Sue and I work together at New South Wales DPI. Sue's um, a principal sheep researcher in Australia, and it's wonderful to have Sue here. Her job today is to give us an overview of the sheep production strategic project that she is working on, and I welcome Sue. So good afternoon everyone, no, good morning, it's still morning. Um, it's great to be out in a room full of producers running a business from your home by yourself. You know, for me it was like COVID every day because that's what my life is like. So it's really great to be out and talking to producers. So what I'm talking about today is a role I've been working on with MLA since no, um, November. So MLA have put together a sheep, um, a sheep reproduction strategic partnership and I'm doing the national coordination role of that. So I'm giving you a bit of an overview about what it's about, why it came about, what the key things we're looking at and some of the, some of the projects that we're funding from a national point of view for sheep reproduction. So this is an industry-led initiative. It was started in sort of the, towards the middle of 2020 or a bit earlier. And AWI, Animal Health Australia, sheep producers, wool producers and MLA sort of came together because we really understand that improving reproductive performance of sheep, it's consistently the highest ranked priority that all the regional advisory committees come back to MLA and AWI with. So how do we improve sheep reproduction, particularly in this environment of high sheep, high um, land prices? So how can we drive it and how do we improve it? So we know that um, you know, it's recognised as a big opportunity for the industry. It's an opportunity for growth. It's also a big risk we have in terms of animal welfare. So we know from productivity and profitability point of view, improving sheep reproduction has a big impact on your farm bottom line. At the moment, when we're looking for rebuilding from drought and the, the reply, prices of replacement sheep are so high, improving reproduction is a key platform for us to build our flock back up to greater numbers as well. There's also some work going on in terms of the more productive sheep you are, it has benefits from a methane point of view, so we can lift our environmental credentials as well. But also the social licence issue comes up a lot. You know, the main, the main death of lambs is starvation in some areas, and you know, little fluffy, beautiful, cute little lambs starving to death over three or four days is not something that we want to sort of have been picked up by the people that are um, hitting us with things like mulesing because um, we don't want to go down that path. And so this is why sheep reproduction is the big focus for the RDCs and that's why this partnership has come about. So the mission of the partnership is to profitably and sustainably increase land production through increasing weaning rates and decreasing new mortality. So all the work the partnership does, all the work that I do, firmly has that mission statement in mind. So the work I'm talking about later, about the projects we're funding, about the work I'm trying to do with consultants to improve knowledge and get information out there, it's all with that mission in mind. And if, if someone comes with an idea or it doesn't fit with that mission, well then it kind of gets back shelved to make sure that everything we do is delivering outcomes for producers on farm. So the important thing of why we need a partnership, particularly for reproduction, is it's, as Laura showed you in her presentation, you know, it's a, it's a complex cycle. You work from weaning through the next weaning, you get all the stages correct and you have the successful outcome. And so what we really need is longer term projects. We know that reproductive performance is a lowly heritable trait in terms of whatever trait you're looking at. We know season has a big impact. And so to get really good applicable results, we have to run larger projects covering different regions and we have to cover different seasonal effects. So that's what this is about. It also aligns with MLA's focus of, I um, know oh I'm gonna get it wrong, Mitch. Fewer, bigger, bolder projects, I think is the catch line, but Mitch will fix it up. What was that? There we go, there we go. I need to work on my catch lines a little bit better. So it's about establishing strategic partners also. So this, we want, we want um, our research partners to co-invest in the research and that gives them more ownership and more um, drive to get out the results for producers. Um, we need, as I said, you know, collaboration is really important to make sure the work's applicable to all the environments across the country and also we need that scale for reproduction as well. So in um, June last year, um, the sheep industry organisations commissioned a report um, which really looked at an impact assessment of all the sheep reproduction research and extension programs that have been going on for the last 10 to 15 years. And so I'm using this report as my blueprint to sort of plan what we're doing with the partnership going forward. 
So there were lots of recommendations came out of that. Some of it was to do with levy funding and a few other things. But thinking about things like what are the key, what are the KPI targets for reproduction and, and what do we what do we look for and what are the benchmarks for different regions so we know where different flocks are sitting. Um, what's the value proposition for reproduction? Because we know um, that different people value it in different ways and we know there are some consultants out there that don't see the value in, in improving reproduction. So we need to make sure that we're, we, we understand as an industry the value it's giving to cheap producers and we're valuing it the same way. Uh, we wanted to develop a reproduction rd &E plan, which we're working on again, which gives us a blueprint to move forward. And we really want to focus on increasing adoption. So I've been a scientist before I worked, worked for my own company. I was principal research scientist at DPI for about 21 years. There's a lot of research out there. And we need to really make sure that when we're funding new research, we're not reinventing the wheel. But also it might be that some of the research we've already funded might just need some, some tweaking or some modifying for different regions. And that's where MLA's PDS or Produce Demonstration Site program comes in. And that's where that work that I'm working with Laura on really comes in to try and focus on the rangelands and really understand what the key issues are. Can our existing body of research be modified to fit with you or do we have to do something else because we've got the gaps? Um, so one of the things I'm really focusing on at the moment while our projects are getting up and going through contracting is really focusing on the next users. So, so the producers, but also the whole group of livestock consultants that work with producers to improve reproduction. So we know on an Australia-wide basis, New South Wales is the exception because you still have livestock government advisory service provided by Sally and her team through the local land service network. But a lot of other um, states in Australia, that's no longer an issue. So it's no longer done as a service. So we have lots of private consultants. We need to keep linking in with the research, create the collaboration with researchers, and also make sure they've got the information at their fingertips to actually come and work with you guys as producers. So that's something I've been focusing with at the moment. So in terms of how the partnership works, we have a management committee that I work with. So they're made up of representatives from Salrac, from Walrac, from Sheep Producers Australia and MLA. And the management committee, it's chaired by Jane Kellogg out of South Australia. We have Ian Rogan on the, this is going to test my memory. We have Ian Rogan from um, New South Wales, um, Tim Watts and a couple of producer members as well. So their role is to really engage with the regional Salrac, Walrac committees to make sure that the priorities those committees are bringing up are addressed by the partnership. They monitor and advise on how our partnership's progressing and really provide a really important critique and, and I guess produce a ground truthing of the project submissions that come in. And as the program coordinator, it's my role to sort of work with the program management committee and also with our stakeholders to make sure we're delivering information out to industry. So we have four key pillars for our research and the work that we do. Um, and they were, they were developed through um, networking and, and workshopping with the CELRAC and WALRAC teams. So we have our on-farm on best practice management. Um, we have our human social factors. That's really about greater understanding of what's driving adoption, what's stopping adoption, so we can try and get our results out there better. Um, enabling technologies, and also that's underpinned by our basic research and development. So we still need to do the research now that's going to give us the benefits into the future. So we put out a foundation call for projects uh, that closed in October last year um, and we looked at those four, four key pillars like looking at getting the benchmarks, examining um, the economic impact, looking at adoptability, developing a process for measuring um, reproductive performance and also thinking about as I said that basic R&D, what's going to deliver us the returns for the future. So in terms of putting together the terms of reference for that call, MLA commissioned two reviews. So one of them was the review of um, the impact of heat stress on reproductive performance, and the other one was on dystochia or fitness to lamb, as they were identified as a couple of key priorities by the different um, <coughs> committees and reviews. So I just want to step you through a couple of these. So this is, um, and for the students out there, they're really good papers to read, okay? So, good ones to read. They give you a really good overview of the whole issue of the reproductive performance of the flock, okay? So this is just a couple of slides from the heat stress review. And what it's interesting that from a global um, science point of view, they define heat stress as greater than or equal to 32 degrees Celsius. Which for most of us, even in me who lives in the tablelands in New South Wales, that's pretty much our animals are being heat stressed almost the whole time. 
So that's, that's an interesting point of view. And you can see that um, for rams in terms of heat stress from the sort of seven weeks or so leading up to joining when we know the sperm is being performed, the heat stress can have some really significant impacts, impact, impact, sorry, on fertility, on sperm numbers, on abnormal sperm, embryos, and then once um, we get together with joining, embryo survival and pregnancy rates can be have a big impact on heat stress. When we look at ewes on that um, coming up to joining, and that's sort of seven days before joining, we know that heat stress can impact on their how they behave in their estrus, the incidence of estrus, you know, embryo loss, that kind of thing, and lambing rates. And also following sort of um, um, joining, embryo loss and everything has an impact as well. So heat stress, based on the international research, can have some significant effects at that very first part of the reproductive cycle. And then as you move through, it can have impacts, you know, from early gestation, late gestation, ewe milk production. So all those key things that Laura talked about, about when we're setting up the placenta, when we're setting up follicle population and milk production, heat stress can have negative impacts on all of that. So the main conclusions from the, I mean, don't write notes on this slide, so don't take my word for it when you're writing an assessment, these are the main points. Read the paper yourself. <coughs> A little hint, your lecturers will know, they'll all see the same slide, you don't want to tell them the same thing over again. So, so we know that there is high potential for heat stress during pregnancy to impact lamb survival, and under feed conditions it could be quite, under field it could be quite high. Remember the benchmark for the international studies was 32 degrees. So given that we're joining in some areas December, January, where it's 42, 45, the potential can be quite high. Um, and it may already contribute to loss of lambs you know, on a global basis. But for extensive sheep production um, systems in Australia, remembering a lot of European um, sheep production systems are intensive, things are lambed in, in, in big sheds and barns. Um, you know, we really don't know how heat stress impacts on the animal's ability to regulate its temperature, on how it behaves, how it grazes, and also reproduction. And it applies to ewes, to rams, and also we want to know, you know, if, if, if a lamb's born in a heat stressed environment to a heat stressed ewe, what does that mean about their lifetime performance? Because epigenetics is a really important thing now. What, what happens to the mum and the conditions she's experiencing can have an impact on your young um, down the track. So this is the kind of work that, that we wanted to um, look at for our, our call. And the other one was dystochia. So um, the, this review was led by Caroline Jacobson from Murdoch Uni. Now she just did a webinar for MLA about a month or so ago. I think it was about the 7th of April that you'll find on the MLA website. So again, she'll give you a really good overview of what was in the review. But so they looked at um, the impact of dystochia, and most of the time we think about dystochia, we think about, oh, it's a, it's, a, it's a single ewe with a big lamb, that's the problem. But what this review has shown us is it's actually, it can be quite significant for twin-bearing ewes as well. And so it's really expanding what we know about dystochia. But again, if you look at the results in the literature, there's inconsistency. We really want to do further research to investigate and understand more about dystochia under commercial conditions. So we want to think about defining the fitness of the ewe to lamb, the role of stress in the environment on parturition, and how whether we can use indicator traits to select for ease of birth. So that's, that was sort of went into the terms of reference for the project call. And we had nine, this was a MDC project call, so the key point for that is that um, the research groups had to co-invest. So they weren't just asking for levy money, they had to bring a consortium together, it had to be large projects, they had to co-invest money um, into the program. And so of those nine applications, we endorsed um, three for further development. Um, we didn't get any um, projects into the human social factors pillar, but that's something we'll be working on in the next 12 or so months. So in terms of the projects that were um, endorsed as of the 14th of April, the heat stress project, so that's up and running. The contract was executed a couple of weeks ago, and I'll talk about that in a second. We have a dystochia project where Murdoch's the lead agency. We're ongoing negotiations in terms of contracting with them. And also there was a consortium letter out of South Australia about sort of benchmarking and understanding more about regional differences. Um, and that's parked until this month when um, Joe Goebbels, who's the program manager, comes back on deck. So a bit of an overview about the heat stress project. So this is led by UWA, but it's actually a nationwide project. So we've got project partners from Murdoch University, from CSIRO, from Sydney University, and also New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. <clears throat> so it's really about quantifying the impacts of heat stress on reproduction, 
thermoregulatory capacity, behaviour and wellbeing. So there'll be some intensive research at UWA's research farm at Ridgefield, which is um, on the coastal wheat belt of Western Australia. Um, and it's very dry there, and they have that really big seasonal Mediterranean environment. So you go from sort of boom to bust every single year. Um, I've lived in New South Wales for about 23 years now. And so I came, I came to New South Wales, to the Central Tablelands, in 1997, when apparently there was this massive drought. And I'm looking with my WA eyes on who sees worse than that pretty much every year. And I couldn't quite, you know, it's hard to get your head around the differences across the country and how we have to make the research fit all those different environments. So um, they've got, the, they have the, the three sites. So they have the fully exposed site, they have the 70% exposed and the 30% exposed in terms of shade and cover on the property and lots of sensors and technology to measure behaviour and core temperature, all kinds of things. And then they'll be looking at sentinel animals on commercial sites in locations all around um, WA and New South Wales. And the rangeland site, for those of you familiar with Western Australia, is between Payne's Find and Mekathara. So that is a very challenging environment for sheep production. I've got some friends that run a station up there and it's a very challenging environment for sheep production as I'm sure it is around here too and further west. And also they'll be covering three breeding seasons. So we'll be collecting all this information using lots of sensors and technologies to make sure that we're capturing as much information as we can to really understand what's going on. So as I said, that project um, was contracted a couple of weeks ago. We'll start getting results from the work when, the, when it commences. And um, that's something they'll be managing as we go forward. In terms of the sort of things I've been doing at the moment while we're waiting for some projects to get up, up and running, is really looking at our stakeholders in terms of reproduction. Who are they? What messages we need to get out there? How do you need the messages? And which ones we're sort of targeting? How, what's the best way to get messages out to different parts of the industry? And really doing what I'm doing today, just letting people know the partnerships around, we're working in this area and getting, getting feedback of what we're doing. One of the focuses I've had at the moment is really on what we're calling the next users. So this is the people that works directly with producers to help you implement the information on farm. And that's something I'm going to be working on at the moment. Um, one of the things that I found um, that was a particular challenge is going from a research environment where <clears throat> you do research and you've got all the world's global research at your fingertips on the computer, that when you leave the department and you work for yourself, all of that's gone. And in terms of being a scientist or a consultant, that's like having someone cut your legs off and still expect you to walk or run. That's really hard to do. And so one of the things I've started doing this year is to put out a reproduction RDNA alert. So this is something I do once a month. It goes out the last week of the month and it captures all the latest sheep reproduction research that's out there and it goes out in a PDF. At the moment it goes to 101 people directly and probably another probably three times that indirectly. So the point of this is we have all the latest research. Um, for each paper it gives you the highlights and the abstract. It gives you the, um, the author's names but also the contact details of the lead author. So I'm trying to encourage collaboration. So when Laura reads the research alert and she goes, oh, I've got her producers ask me about that, she can then get in contact with that lead researcher and talk about the research. So I want to try and encourage that sort of collaboration. And it also allows people to go and have a look at their full paper if they need to. And also, also as part of that, um, every month it goes out in terms if there's any new milestone reports or project final reports, if there's any industry events. I think you'll find that the March and April one had today's there as an industry event. And also funding opportunities. So kind of trying to build collaboration in industry. And that's gone out, um, yeah, I've done about four or five issues so far. And the other thing that I'm working on too is a, a curated database of sheep reproduction knowledge because one of the key findings of the Beattie and Howard report was how do we make sure everyone's singing from the same song sheet? So how do we know that the information our next users are providing to producers is consistent and it's the right information? Um, I know from a science point of view, I would do the research, publish it, and occasionally I might go to a field day and there'd be someone talking about my work and they might have got a little bit wrong. Which is, I mean, I work in applied genetics, so the chance of things get a little bit wrong, you know, can, be, can happen. But if, but if I think, you know, if we look at this database, if, if we can capture information about projects, we can benchmark it to each part of the reproductive cycle, um, so that, you know, if Laura's getting a question or any consultant from a producer about it, they can go into the database, they can look at part of the reproductive cycle, there's all the research that's related to it. There might be a five minute video, there might be a fact sheet, there might be some PowerPoint. So trying to get all this scientific information 
in a digestible way that our next users can use directly for producers or for students doing assignments. So this is in the early stages, so I'm collecting all the information, I'm benchmarking it together and looking at how it fits to the whole breeding cycle. So for all the new research that's coming out there and all the funded projects, um, so for all the MLA, all the AWI funded projects, all the PDS projects, you know, how do they fit to the sheep breeding cycle? Are they, are they related to weaning? Are they related to joining mid-pregnancy? Which breed, which sex, you know, lambs, ewe lambs, maidens, adults, which stage of the repro cycle, but also trying to benchmark it to regions. So we're really clear about the information we have available, which will be good for, our, for you guys as producers, but also for our advisors. But also it really help us identify where the gaps are. Because once we get this set up, if we look into a particular area and we've got gaps, it's a really good way of, of sort of focusing where we need to get some, some work done to address the gaps. So that's something I'm working on at the moment. And the other thought I'm just working on too is, is how, do we, how do we collect info to make the best decisions? So we've talked, to, and Laura talked about, you know, the, the, the cycle, you've got to do all these things as we go along. But we know that, you know, the different, different flocks are running in different ways, different environments, and what works for one environment might not work for you. Differences in mob size. So as a producer, how do you know where your, where your problems are? And then how do you know what's the best solution for you? Because it can be quite different. So I'm trying to think about what, what's, is there a tool or a system we can put into place for producers to really get a greater understanding of their whole reproductive performance so you can identify which bits are limiting you and which bits you can put into your property at the right time, at the right pl place to give you that greatest gain. So that gives you an overview of where we're going with the partnership, the type of things I'm working on. Um, and thank you. We're on? Yep, thanks John. Questions for Sue? Come on, not everyone. Everyone's had a little smoke a little no. rest. No? Well, if you, if you think of a question after, I mean, a lot, a lot of my role is, um, you know, coordinating issues and feedback back through to the management committee, but also to the MLA program manager, Joe Gebbles, who works in the sort of sheep productivity area. So my contact details are there, so you don't be afraid to be in contact, have a discussion, and we can sort of work together to improve our performance going forward. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sue. Okay, our next speaker is Mitch Plum. He's, um, Mitch is um, one of my mob. He's an ex-extension officer. Mitch was based out at um, 